The Negro Motorist Green Book, first published in 1936, was a critical guide for African Americans traveling during the 40s, 50s, and early 60s. It was created by a Harlem postal worker, Victor Green, and his colleagues who gathered a listing of restaurants, bars, hotels, and private homes that welcomed black travelers across the country. In a time where Americans started hitting the road, African Americans faced restrictions as they traveled. Although you could purchase a car, you couldn't get gas, stay in hotels, or eat in restaurants. Travel was difficult and dangerous. Ben's Chili Bowl at 1213 U Street, Washington, D.C. was originally a silent movie theater called the Minnehaha. It was later featured in the Green Book as a pool hall. Since 1958, Ben's Chili Bowl has continued the legacy of the Green Book providing a refuge for the whole community. I was born in Washington, D.C. in 1939 in a segregated hospital. I lived in a segregated neighborhood, and I went to a segregated school. First, I didn't realize any difference because all the people around me looked like me. And I was comfortable with that until I realized that I was being discriminated against. We couldn't shop downtown at the major stores. You couldn't try on clothes. You couldn't try on hats because if you tried them on, they, they didn't want you to get grease on the hats. You know, we oil our hair and our makeup is dark. And so they didn't want us to try on clothes because you might get makeup on the clothes. I remember being about seven, maybe 10 years old in Hex Department store when a little girl called me a nigger and spat on me. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't retaliate. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. I was so angry inside, but I couldn't do anything about it because I knew that it would be blamed on me. The Green Book was a guide for African Americans to travel safely, to find shelter, food, and gas in a time where these basic rights were not guaranteed. Washington, D.C. had more listings in the Green Book than any other city in this country. The 1213 U Street was listed in the Green Book, and that's why we are sitting here in Ben's Chili Bowl at 1213 U Street today. From the very day that we opened up to the current time, it's still a safe haven for people. And we invited the community in, and we started with the neighborhood young men that thought this was home for them. They always sat over there at that corner. There was always eight, six, eight, ten of them every evening from different walks of life in the community. When someone spilled something on the floor and their staff was busy, one of them took care of it, would go in the back of them up. If we were running out of ice, they'd say, hey, Joe, go get some ice for me kind of place. Um, that was the building, the beginning of the building of a relationship with this community. These young guys had found this to be home. As soon as they started to broadcast professional basketball, put the TV up for them to keep them here. So they wouldn't have to go see that game someplace else. We didn't have TVs in Ben City Hall, but that was for them. And that brought in that segment of our community. And then, of course, this being the strong, um, close-knit community that it was, when you came here for a chili dog, you ran into a friend. particularly in the early 50s. When we would leave Washington, D.C. on the train, 
we could sit anywhere on the train until you got to the Virginia line. And when you get to the Virginia line, you had to go to the last train on the back. And I remember being so frustrated because we could not eat on the highway. If the train stopped, we couldn't eat. We couldn't relieve ourselves on the train. You either had to hold it or relieve yourself sitting there and then you're wet. When the train stopped, you would get off the train and you would relieve yourself outside, almost like you would if you were a dog. And that's the way, basically, I thought that white people felt about me as a black African-American or Negro woman or whatever, nigger woman or whatever, that they felt like I was not human not a human being, that I, I was less than a human being. I see people treat their dogs better now. Right now, they treat the dogs better than they treated us as, as black Americans. Well, you know, one of the things that I remember was traveling from southwest Georgia down to Mississippi. And this was right after Miss Hamer had been beaten. beaten. I mean, they dragged her off the bus and beat her and, you know, I mean, crippled her. And one of the things that I remembered on that bus, I felt that two things. First, I had to sit in the front of the bus, just like you. Uh, but second, I also was in my head saying, you know, what am I going to do if these people come on the bus and try to treat me like Miss Hamer? And one of the things I was very clear about is that I was not getting off the bus and going to any of these places to try to use the bathroom. I was not going to get off the bus to try to, 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 uh, to, try to get anything to eat. I knew enough to pack a lunch before I, I got on that bus. Now, it was a 10-hour ride from uh, Albany, Georgia, down to Jackson, Mississippi. But, I mean, it was, you know, it was really tough trying to not only deal with the question of where you're going to go to the bathroom, where you're going to go eat, but whether if you exercised your right under the law, whether somebody was going to come up there and try to assault you. That was a reality that we wanted to change. I mean, I remember I was maybe 14 years old when I started seeing the challenge, the real challenge in Montgomery with the bus boycott with uh, Rosa Parks, just in terms of local transportation and interstate transportation, we had to face people telling us, you not good as we are. And now, because of people who got on the bus and challenged, you know, the, the, the institutions that were developed, we now can, you can dream big. You can dream bigger than we could dream. We, you know, it was important. I mean, the biggest thing that we were able to do, and you know, and Frank can tell you this, the, the biggest thing we were able to do is we were able to say, you cannot block our dream. Now, we couldn't say what our dreams were, but we could say, you can't block our dreams. You can't tell us what we can't do. We're gonna kick down all these barriers. Those barriers could be life-threatening. Every trip through America for a black person during those times was potentially fatal. It seemed like many people were out to hurt us or even kill us just because we we're black. The assumption is at some time it stopped. And that's not the case. It never stopped. That's a continuous thing that hasn't changed since the beginning of the relationship that exists here between blacks and whites in the United States. It's like a river that keeps flowing and we don't really see all of it. But at the end of the day, it's something that started back in slavery and continues today. Young black people don't have the green book in front of them, but they have it in their head. 
where you're no longer looking at, you know, no Negroes allowed and stuff like that, but you're looking at the same thing which says, these are barriers here, and then people feel that if you cross these barriers, they have a right to kill you. Tamir was such a energetic kid, you know. At 12 years old, he would actually get up in my arms as big as he was and let me hold him and kiss him and squeeze all on him. So that day when you got the knock on the door, what happened? So I was actually coming from the store and... Uh, putting groceries up and a knock came at the door. Two little boys told me that my son was shot by the police. And I was like in denial. I'm like, no, you're not talking about my kids. My kids is at the rec playing. And my oldest son was laying on the couch. He wasn't feeling well, but he ran out right past mm -hmm. me. I guess he heard it in a little boy's voice. And um, he, wow. ran, he ran out before me and um and I'm still trying to get my coat and my shoes on talk about no nah, you no nah, my kids is my my kids is playing and then surely enough as I walk across the street uh around a little track where I could see the kids my son is laying on the ground with 10 police officers surrounding him and my daughter is screaming in the back of the police car and they have my uh other son surrounded and they put him in the back of the police car so it was it was terrible it was that's that's how that day turned out the police asked me uh when they asked me they told me to uh, calm down or they were going to put me in the back of the police car because i was trying to get to my son they never let me get to him they also let me ride in the front seat as a passenger of the police car of the ambulance of the ambulance so i never even got a chance to get back you know to, close to my son to hold his hand to kiss him and let him know that it was going to be all right i don't know what they were doing so he was in the back of the ambulance and you were in the front yeah i was in the front like a passenger what kind of service were they giving to mir at the scene i don't know because they were surrounding him they were surrounding him and I, the couldn't, officers I couldn't were... i couldn't really see what were the officers doing they were just standing there well they were just blocking me not letting me uh go towards him and telling me to calm down and I'm telling them you need to let my kids out the car. They're minors and stuff like that. And like I told them, they gave me an ultimatum to uh, stay at the scene of the crime with the other two children or to go with Tamir. I choose to go with Tamir and I had to leave two children at the scene of a crime. Everybody seen what happened to my son. You know, it was, they didn't even want to release that tape. My attorney had to threaten them to release the tape. And after that tape was released, it just went, went worldwide. What did you see on that tape? Like, what was your reaction to it? My son was scared when they rolled up. They was, he was scared. And he, and he, he shrugged his shoulders like this. Mm -hmm. They tried to say he was reaching for his waistband. He wasn't reaching for nothing. Like when you roll up fast like that, you scared him. Absolutely. And, and uh, that's what I see. My son he was, was just scared. like stuck. He was just like. Yeah, like, what did I do? Right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's uh, I would never get that vision out of my head. That's devastating. I play it over and over again. Also, with the um, picture of him laying on a gurney and they would not allow me to touch him because they said he was evidence. Mm. So I didn't even get a chance to touch him or none of that. So yeah. no, no kiss goodbye, hug, kiss, no nothing, nothing, no fill on nothing, nothing. So they said he was evidence, so I couldn't touch him. And I don't really know how that works. What um, ultimately happened to Tamir's body? So, um... I had to get Tamir 
I didn't have to. I choose to uh, get him cremated. I don't really think I told anyone that, but I don't want to leave my son in Cleveland when I leave Ohio. Mm. So I will be taking him and my mother with me. You know, you know, I have them in arms in my house. So to take him everywhere that you go, yeah. every stage of the rest of your life. Yeah, he has to go with me. Yeah, because uh, he just has to go. I wasn't, I wasn't finished raising him. You know, I wasn't finished nourishing him. And America robbed me. Yep, they robbed me. So when people talk about the American dream. Hmm. What do you call it? A nightmare. <laughs> Especially if you're black. Yeah. Traveling while black means to me that discrimination segregation is still alive and well and that even though I don't have to have the green book to guide me to a black person's house and I can stay in any hotel I want but just think about the people who have been killed while traveling black a young man who was involved in the schools in the area where he lived, killed in front of his fiance and their child, traveling while black. Traveling while black, I'm driving down the highway and the police decide to stop me. Even though I'm an elderly black woman, I could be killed just because I'm black and don't give them the answer that they want traveling while black in America is still happening. And I am really frightened for black men traveling while black. I wonder when does it end?